Hello and welcome. I'm your host, author Ryan M. Oliver, and this is the Mighty Books Podcast. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Mighty Books Podcast. Today with me, I have Kathy Hester Seckman. So real quick on Kathy. She has been a published writer since the 1980s, mostly in nonfiction. Her writing credits include thousands of pieces in newspapers and magazines. She's also a professional indexer, having indexed topics that range from terrorism to fashion design to ultrasound technology. Her published books include Weirdo World, H2O Mysteries, Too Many Secrets, East Liverpool, and Ohio Day Trips. Her latest release, Right Side, Wrong Side, which we're talking about today from the Wild Rose Press, is up for pre-order and will be released October 30th of 2023. She and her husband live just outside a map dot called Calcutta, Ohio, and love traveling, hiking, and motorcycling. Welcome, Kathy. How are you doing today? Hello. I'm great. Awesome. Wonderful. I'm really glad to have you on here. So let's let's start off with a bang. So I already kind of talked about what your book was called, but go ahead and repeat the title for everybody. <laughs> Right side, wrong side. All right. And what is that about? It's an interesting, interesting title. And I I'll, I'll, I'll want to get into the cover later, too. OK, right side, wrong side is a colony world from Earth. The people have been there 71 years as the book opens and they have separated between male and female. The women live in right side. Good for us. <laughs> They're in charge of everything. Uh, the men live in wrong side behind a 200 mile border fence and they do what the women tell them. Oh, really? Interesting. Yes, they do. I feel like we're already there. We just don't have a wall. But anyway, hmm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so how did that how did you get inspired? What what, what inspired the idea for this book? Um, Commander Riker. Commander Riker? Yes. And can you go? You don't know that who part? that is. I don't actually. Oh my goodness! I don't. Um, he was he was the second in command of the Enterprise on Star Trek: The Next Generation. Oh okay, yeah, okay. I'm not a Star Trekky. <laughs> Big muscular, masculine type of person, kind of a leader, always in charge. He gets marooned on a planet that has a matriarchal government, oh. and he becomes the sort of love toy of one of the people in government. And it struck me when I watched it, how ludicrous it was, how silly it was for mm -hmm. one sex to be in charge of the other mm -hmm. and to determine everything that happens. And it was kind of funny and kind of interesting. And I thought, well, I could write a book on that. Isn't that funny how that happens? One little, mm -hmm. one little show or one idea and you just jump on and make a whole mm -hmm. book out of the thing. Well, that's pretty neat. I won't lie. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So I want to real quick talk about the the cover. Because when I saw wrong side, right side, right side, wrong side on, on your cover, the cover is actually really interesting. I thought of like, okay, right side, wrong side of the tracks is kind of what I my mind mm. went to. Uh, but can you explain? Um, I'll, we'll have the cover obviously on the thumbnail so you guys can see it for all the uh, mediums. But can you explain how you came up with the wrong side, right side, or describe it real fast and then and then go into how that became about? How I came up with the cover? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's I very didn't. interesting. You didn't? Oh, okay. I didn't. Okay. No. Who, no. How, the that was Wild, the Rose, Wild Press. Rose Press has artists who take care of that. It's coming out in you know a little over a month, so that's exciting. That's really exciting. What are you doing to prepare for the launch? Um, this for one yeah. thing, <laughs> I have some blogs that I'll be guesting on and cool. I have local events I'll be attending, et cetera. And I'll put it all on social media. Of course, you got to put it on social media. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I was also really interested. You said you started, you're a published writer since the 1980s. So you're doing indexing, a professional indexer. I don't know what that is. And I don't know mm -hmm. if anyone else does. Maybe they do. Maybe they're way smarter than me. What is an indexer? <laughs> there aren't actually that many of us. <clears throat> Publishers of nonfiction books want indexes in the back so that people can look things up. Oh, and sure. they used to have in-house people to do that, but now it's more or less all freelance. And there are, I don't know, probably less than 500 indexes, indexers in the United States. Oh I'm gosh. not sure of the number anymore. And I ran across the whole idea in a book called 
something like the 50 best jobs to work from home with. And that was in 2002, something like that. I forget the title. So <clears throat> I looked it up. There's an American Society for Indexing. They offered a course. I took the course. And probably three months after I finished it, I had my first job. And I was in the black by the second job. And what I do is I have a really wide monitor. I put the PDF on one side, the PDF of the finished book. I'm the last person to deal with the book, basically, before it goes to print. I have the PDF and I have an indexing program. There are two or three of them. Then I read the text. You know, I read a page or two at a time and decide what needs to be indexed depending on what I think a reader will want to look up. Okay. If it's, if it's say it's a book about dog training. Okay. Yeah. I can't index the word dog because that's the meta topic. You know, I would have one main entry and a 850 sub entries under that. So I index other things. Okay. So this is about dog training and I might have, a top a main topic that says history of history of dog training and anytime i run across anything in the book that reflects the history i index that i make a sub entry i put the page number i move on to the next thing oh my goodness okay okay so and it's interesting that you went from because you wrote you're writing a non-fiction or you're writing a fiction book but you did indexing for non non-fiction have right. you ever thought about doing non-fiction well, I have two nonfiction books out. Oh, one of two. them, yeah, one of them is East Liverpool. That's an Arcadia history nice. of my hometown. Nice. And the other is Ohio Day Trips. I'm assuming you did the indexing for that. I did the index for <laughs> Ohio Day Trips, but they didn't allow me to do that for East Liverpool. I wonder I why. I was only allowed something like 30 entries, and that would have been pointless. Oh, okay. Okay. How many indexing do you usually do? How much indexing do you usually do for a book generally? Um, let's, you mean how many I do at like a per time? book, like every, every line item you said, you'd only, you'd only be able to do 30 for the East oh, Liverpool one. And, and yeah, well, you... for the East Liverpool book, I would have done three or 400, I think. Oh yeah. Dang. Yeah. Because I'm pretty picky about it. I want yeah. every single topic and every single idea and concept to be oh, indexed. Okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I've never heard that, but it makes sense now that you're, you, you mentioned like, okay, I've always wondered about if the author did that, or in this case, another person does, does all that. That's interesting. I had no idea. Yeah. Um, so your published books, you know, weirdo world H2O mysteries. Uh, how, how long ago did you publish those? Weirdo world was 2011, maybe. Okay. okay. And it's a, it's a middle grade time travel fantasy it was put out by cool well press which folded a year later oh. um so the book i put it up on amazon myself yeah um let's see h2o mysteries is an anthology of mysterious disappearances by water oh okay and th yeah three of us in my writers group put that together and put it up on amazon and we had so much fun that we did two novels and that was bad moon rising and too many secrets Oh my goodness. So yeah, you've done a bunch together. And so um so you've done the a collab. So how is it doing a collab versus doing a a solo solo project? Um good and bad. <laughs> it was good because we could bounce ideas off each other and come up with plots together. Mm -hmm. But it was bad because the other two and none of us would always go in the direction the other two wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And we, you know, had a few arguments about that and we just let other things go. And it turned out to be sort of a mashup and I wouldn't do it again, but it was fun. I imagine it's kind of like a group project in school. It's just like, yeah, you, know, you, divvy exactly. the nice you can divvy up the work, but then you've got the, the, I don't know if this happened with you particularly, but you always got that one person who's like not really pulling their weight and you got other people who are, or like you said, budding, you know, butting heads, uh, personalities or different approaches. So I would definitely be frustrating, but I love the idea of bouncing ideas off each other because mm -hmm. as a fiction author, like myself as well, it's so hard when you're in the trenches of your story, 
you sometimes can't see all the options. And so having the opportunity to talk with somebody, especially if they're working on the same story you are, to bounce ideas because they might have a different perspective or approach is is so much a it's so much fun i love brainstorming with people yeah. that that can i can go for hours brainstorming but two you can just make up with all these interesting ideas you would have never thought of in the first place so it'd be mm-hmm. kind of cool to work on a collab but 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 you do have to compromise oh yes you absolutely mm-hmm. do you can't be just a bully and nope we're doing it my way it's not that's not how it works <laughs> that's not how it works that's just not the real world at all whatsoever so for right side, wrong side, how long did it take you to create the story and write it to the the uh, state it's in now, nearly, you know, published? Um, <laughs> maybe you've heard this before, but 14 years. 14 years? Hey, yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> I, I wrote, I had the idea, I wrote the first maybe five chapters in a tearing hurry, and then I ran out of ideas and put it away. And every once in a while, I get it out and add a little bit. And then maybe three years ago, I decided I'll finish it or throw it away. So I finished it. By three years ago, you mean 2020 when we all had to stay home and yeah, <laughs> That's, that was when. <laughs> That's yeah. I've heard about. I've heard that before. I've mm-hmm. I've called I've called us um, COVID authors is what I've coined uh-huh. it as on occasion. So mm-hmm. uh, a lot were like, "What do I do with myself? Why well, you can sit here and." feel bad about not being able to go outside and hang out with people or I can get a project done. Yeah. So I've always called, I've called those folks around the time 2020 to 20, you know, 2022 COVID authors, because a lot of time people were changing how they had to work or they were had more time or whatever, but it sounded like with indexing, were you able to work from home that entire time? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. I Well, I always worked at home with indexing. Awesome. So really nothing changed too much at least for your day-to-day i imagine no okay well other than being just isolated at home with my husband and my cats right 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 <laughs> can't go out and do other things yeah no, that it was definitely challenging definitely challenging um i myself had i started the process prior to covid coming out but that was one probably uh i was a huge aspect or a factor that helped me get it done as fast as i did mm-hmm. when, when it finally did come out in uh, october of 2020 but uh, oh my goodness, some crazy stuff. So when you were going through uh, creating right side, wrong side, did you like, I, I always create not necessarily picture boards or storyboards, but oh. I like write it out in an outline and I always have kind of a plan, like where I'm steering the story. Did you do the same thing or is it kind of just comes out organic? No, I'm, I'm a pantser. I write by the seat of my pants. <laughs> And I've tried outlining; doesn't yeah. work. Oh, I, I but I try that. to stay. A, I try to stay a few steps ahead of myself. Yeah. As I'm writing, I think, well, wait a minute. After this, I could maybe do that. And right. I'll write a note. Right. And that's okay. As far as I get with outlining. Okay, I think that's kind of more where I go to because I might create the outline, and it might be from you know point A to all the way to letter Z because there's always so many different you know, steps you take to try to get to where you want to go. And I don't know if this works for you, but I always have like a picture or a scene in my mind and that needs to be in the book. As long as I hit those scenes, the in-between can change very fluidly. So I don't know if (laughs) if that's kind of what your experience is. Yeah. I have to back up a lot and, and add something because it's going to reflect on what I want to do next. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know. Oh, gosh. Yeah. That that's, it's always a cause and effect. It's like, if I do this and I have to change this, mm-hmm. a lot of backing up and whatnot. Oh man, that's crazy. It's like, it's like putting a puzzle together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's like, what is this picture? I'm not really sure. We got to figure this out. Oh, there. Okay. Now I put the pieces together. Mm-hmm. Now it's one big picture or it's a bunch of small little ones. Um. So when you got to the editing, I don't know how, how uh, good or what you, how you feel about editing. Uh, did you have to edit a lot out of this book? I did. I did. And it caused plot holes. Oh, no. You know, I, I ended up with, I don't know, 110,000 words. And I wanted to stay under 100,000. And there were places I knew that just dragged on. So I went back and I was very critical about everything. And I took things out. I mm-hmm. took a lot of unnecessary conversations out. 
and that left a hole, you know, that I had to fill. So I tried to fill it with three sentences and be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That works. And sometimes you can fill those holes with just one or two sentences too. I've noticed mm-hmm. as we, I had, I had to do that too, a few times. Now was the editing process pretty, I mean, once you got through the the cutting out, was it pretty, uh, it was a good relationship with you and the editor? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I had a great editor. Good. She, good. she I mean, pointed out things that I would never, ever have seen in my life. I love that. I love that. Yeah. And it usually will enhance the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing she did that shocked me no end. She said, I want you to do a search for the word hissed Hissed? in your manuscript. And I had like 15 hisses in there, you know, like um, stay away from there. She hissed. Things like that. Oh, okay. And I bet when she said that you were going through and like, oh my gosh, I say this so (laughs) much. Do you you self-identify words you overuse? Yeah, definitely. She found mm-hmm. three of them, but that's the only one I remember. I I found apparently I write or spell more of like the British way of words. I didn't know that oh. was a thing like gray and gray, G-R-E-Y and G-R-A-Y. Apparently, I think I did G-R-A-Y. I can't remember, but one of those is the British version. And my editor is like, you're writing this in a British version. I'm like, you can hear that. <laughs> That's impressive. So he's like, no, this is the actual American spelling. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. fine. I guess change it to the American spelling, whatever. I was trying <laughs> to class it up for you, but whatever. When when I wrote um, Weirdo World, it's a time travel fantasy. Mm-hmm. And it centers around a, a middle grade kid who gets shot back to 1964. Mm-hmm. And there's there's a thing about Tarzan in there. You oh, know, cool. the, today we have Tarzan movies and Tarzan uh, cartoons. Back then there was Johnny Weissmuller, period. Uh, and and so the book opens with a Tarzan yell. Oh. And I just sort of made up syllables that sounded like what I remembered. So when the editor got hold of that, he said, did you know that there is an authorized official spelling for the Tarzan yell? And so I had to change that. What? How there would is. You ever how would you ever even know that? That's so crazy. A person did he have to go back and like research this, or he just know it on top of his head? I don't know, but that's why there were professional editors. That's true. That's true. I've I've have talked to actually I've talked to editors on here before, and I've always asked, always wondering, like, did you edit your own stuff? She's like, well, of course I did, but I had a pair of eyes, other professional eyes to look at it. And I'm like, that makes total sense because when you're, like I said before, and you're in the trenches of your story or your own writing, you think, oh, this is this is actually some pretty good work here. I don't have any errors. <sighs> Baloney. <laughs> we always have errors. Even when it's published, there's errors. <laughs> there will be. And you have to, you know, get get over yourself a little bit. Just going, there will be errors no matter how thorough uh, fine tooth a comb we we use there's always going to be one or two or a dozen whatever <laughs> hopefully less than a dozen but you get the point <laughs> you can't you can't let perfection stop you from some from pushing the stories out now are you a big uh nonfiction or fiction reader or both both yeah mm-hmm. I like, I like history yeah me read too. a lot of history yeah do you feel like that enhances your writing your storytelling yes yeah. Yes. Because um, there are battle scenes in Right Side, Wrong Side. And I've read, um, I don't know, Bernard Cornwell and I can't even think of who else, but, you know, things like The Three Musketeers. Mm-hmm. Um, I got my battle scenes from those kinds of books. Right. Right. Well, um, oh, something else I wanted to wonder. So with Right Side, Wrong Side, it says basically women are dominating over men in the society was it kind of similar to like i don't know like amazons kind of a thing i mean not quite as Um, primitive no they don't fight they don't fight oh no they live on each side of a border fence and in the border fence there are transfer points where they can transfer goods back and forth and there are also what are called red cabins red cabins is where they have sex because they both need babies oh yeah the yeah, they can't survive without babies and the women realized that so you know if they have daughters they keep them they don't say anything to the men the men never know if they have daughters or not if they have baby boys they put them in a drawer and shoot the drawer over to wrong side and the babies go to their fathers the males 
So uh, is it and like then what, the women uh, never see them again? Oh man. So it's like right from birth, like boom, baby. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. Yeah. So not like letting the child grow for a couple of, couple of years or nope. something and then go off to the father. Nope. Right away. Right away. Same day. Here you go. <laughs> Here you go. Figure it out, dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The men are always surprised. Oh well, yeah. I mean, you know, the women have it. They, they see the baby growing for, you know, they feel the baby growing for nine months and they're, you know, it happens. And then the guys, what? I haven't seen her in nine months. Well, here you go. <laughs> oh, they don't know who the mother is. They aren't told that. Oh, okay. 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 Surprise. You're a dad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but but you can see, if you think about that, it's mm-hmm. kind of untenable. It's mm-hmm. not the way a society should be. And, and the entire book is the story of how they get away from it mm-hmm. and how they, how things break down and how they start to rebuild Oh, nice. Okay. So like, does it also, I'm, I'm sure it does, but does it talk about like how the society got to a place, a point, like the history of when it started like that? Yeah. That's the backstory that you have to sprinkle in at the beginning. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You need to have some backstory. I love, I love that kind of stuff. Just kind of mind altering, uh, you know, history of it's super fun to do. I bet that was a lot of fun to create. It, well, it was hard for me because I'd never done it before. Yeah. Um, we always started our, our co-written books at the beginning and went mm-hmm. to the end. But now there's there's a history to this planet that has to be explained. Yeah. And I explained it and explained it and explained it. And there were pages and pages of info dump. And the first person I showed it to said, you don't need all that. I needed it, but the book didn't need it. Yeah, so that's I what... cut out three quarters of it. Oh, yeah. No, that's that makes sense. That's what something I was I was I read about a long time ago is like if you're creating a hero or actually even your antagonist, you know, having their backstory, even just, just for your knowledge, because it it depicts on perspectives. It depicts uh, maybe like choices they're going to make actions they'll take. And you'll know why the reader might not know why for book two, book three, or all Mm -hmm. the way at the end, who knows? But it's important for you to know because you're you're dictating that act that um, character's actions, and if you don't have a reason, it's like it's just kind of like it's just kind of an empty action at that point. You need to have some reason behind it, like why oh well, he was abused in this at this age, or he encountered this problem at this. That's why it's why he thinks this way, and then mm-hmm. later it's revealed. It's, oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense, and not revealing everything is is kind of the beauty of it it adds some mystery to it maybe you do eventually but will there be um a sequel to this one or is this a one-off no there will be a series if i have anything to say about it yeah Yeah, the second book i'm on the last third of it and it's called oceanside oh very cool very cool the, the third book will be called mountainside and i think i have a couple of other titles in mind so are you following the same characters for the first book, the second book, and third book? Yes. Or is it ta- okay. Okay. Yeah. The main uh, characters of the first book will be second secondary characters in the second book. I have oh. new main characters for that. Oh, so people you... who were minor in the first book. Okay, I was I was Plus wondering about new that. Ones. I was wondering about that because I've mm-hmm. seen that a lot in books before, where they take the secondary characters in the first book and they become the main. And at first, when I first saw that. I was like, it seems really strange, but I actually love it because you kind of get used to it. And if you ever go back and reread the first book, you're like, oh, well, this person is, you know, you you learn more about them. And so you can kind of just see more. You understand them a little better. And even mm-hmm. if they're fallible, you're like, well, they're fallible because of this. I can give them some grace because, <laughs> because I know <laughs> a little more about them here when you thought they were jerks or just complete whatever. And and then you read the second, you read the book on them. You're like, okay, well, I see why they're a little little you know sour or or whatever so it makes sense to me and so you you have enough um you don't know when how many you're gonna have written no i i could probably get five i'm not sure yeah we'll see it's a lot of books a lot of work yeah that's that's about what i'm trying to do is get five out i've got Mm -hmm. one one with a little novella and then one big one one novella and then i'm trying to get my second one and it's a lot just to keep going with the same storyline it is but, yeah but it's fun it's fun when you get into it yeah. yeah yeah do you write you know in the evening or morning or do you have a schedule you keep 
I don't. Let's see. I mostly write in the afternoons. Okay. And I can't, I have an office, you know, because I'm an indexer, but I can't write fiction here. Interesting. Because, and I, I think it's mostly because the internet is here. So, you know, and if I have to look something up, I can just, you know, click over to Google or whatever. And then if I get bored, I can click over to solitaire. And, and if I want to know what my, my friend in Indiana is doing, I can click over to Facebook and mm -hmm. it's not good for the writing. So I have a laptop, this laptop yeah. that I only use for writing. And I do that in the living room. Oh, smart. That's smart. And I, I try to that. stay with it in a day until I get at least a couple of thousand words. Oh, wow. Wow. That's great. That's so when you are writing your books, you you're trying to do like a word count, a quota. Mm -hmm. every day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's so you about a couple thousand words. That's really, mm -hmm. that's great productivity, but I don't do it every day. Yeah. 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 It, it's hard happen. to do it every day. It's hard yeah. to do it every day. I did a hundred words a day for a while. Where it was always the minimum. I had to do at least a hundred. So I could go a thousand, five thousand. That's ridiculous. But you didn't know, get my point, but five hundred. And when I was religious with it, holy cow, the productivity, even just note taking, mm -hmm. blogging, right, anything, no anything. Um, I it was just incredible how fast the the manuscript and the the story grew. Um, even if I was just doing the bare one hundred, because a hundred is pretty good. It's like you know, a solid paragraph or a good healthy amount of notes you might average got to be about 500 which is pretty good pretty every day and then it kind of fell off like any habit you know you stop doing it yeah. just, it's like oh, i'm just gonna skip today and tomorrow <laughs> and the next day and i'm not doing it anymore <laughs> mm -hmm. i gotta get back into it so bad so bad life's busy it's just how it goes just how it goes everyone everyone says that mm -hmm. you'll do even a even a professional writer who makes a living from it will say I can, I can find any excuse not to write. <laughs> I'm so good at it too. <laughs> I'm so good at it. And it. It comes in waves. It's so weird. There's just, there's months or weeks where it's like, I have to write and you just, you're in it. You're loving it. You're just drinking it up. It's the best thing in the world. And then you hit that stopping point. Kind of like what you were talking about with yours. You're like, wall. Now what? How do I get over this thing? Uh -huh. Do I have to get a sledgehammer or a rope? Or do I just walk mm -hmm. around? Like you're not sure what to do. And then you put it away for, in your case, you said one, two, three years. That's what mm -hmm. I ended up doing too. <laughs> and then you just go for it later, find it. Oh, there it is. Oh, that's how you get out of this. Okay, let's <laughs> keep moving. It's so frustrating. <laughs> yeah, with with right side and again with ocean side, I if I get stuck somewhere, then I sort of start to daydream about how the story might go. You know, I have some ideas. This will have to happen. That will have to happen. Yeah. And I'll just skip ahead and write that scene. Yeah. And maybe, it, too. maybe it doesn't work after I catch up to it, but at least I've written something. Yeah. I find with just, it's very similar to like, kind of like with fitness. It's like, if you're constantly moving, you're going to be fit or at least healthy or for your stories for writing. If you're just sitting still, not doing anything, you know, you start to go stale. You're not sure what to do. It's like, just write something, give yourself permission to write bad for starters. Like right. that was like my thing. I'm like, <laughs> you can write things that suck. It's okay. You're not perfect. You know, you're not even, you know, might not even be the, uh, the best writer ever. God, no, but write something that sucks <laughs> and then move on <laughs> you can come back and edit it it's okay editing is always easier than the blank page yeah yeah it's so easy when i have something to actually edit like, mm -hmm. yeah what i've said it before i'll say it again but you can always edit garbage you can't edit a blank page that's right just just how it is it's just facts unfortunately so for for your series i love series they're just they're wonderful to dive into the lore and the history of it when you get into the when the story do you want each story to be able to stand alone or do they need to read it you know wrong side right side first then ocean side then mountain side i'm trying hard to make them stand alone yeah because you know i i don't want to require somebody who picks up the second book to have read the first book first sure. <clears throat> and i have enough backstory that refers to the characters that are reappearing Yeah, that I think I'll be okay with that. Yeah. That's hard to do. That's true. It is. 
That's challenging. So do you have uh, alpha readers and beta readers to help you out with that? Um, I do. I have a nephew who's also a writer, but he mostly does technical writing. Okay. Um, He's got a novel that he polishes endlessly. But anyway, <laughs> you get it out. He's but he's no. my good beta reader, and right. my sister will do that, and one of my former co-writers will do okay. that. Oh, good, good, good. And they'll give you a lot of good constructive feedback and what they mm-hmm. feel about it. Mm-hmm. That's good. I love that. And it's nice when you have people who you can trust and not give you just like to be super harsh. It's it's you know, like, hey, I didn't really feel like this. And and uh, did you ever have anything that was just so like traumatic? It's like, hey, this is not going to work. And you go, have you ever had anything like that happen with your writing? Um, No, I don't think so. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> you need to completely rewrite the whole thing. I do not. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. Absolutely mm-hmm. not doing that. Uh, for your characters, how many... Well, actually, I'm curious about your your antagonist. Is your antagonist the society itself, or is your antagonist a person, hmm. or is it both? I think it's the society. Okay. And it's the government, the yeah. government of right side, I guess. Interesting. That'd be fun to just because you're you're fighting against how the societal norms and breaking through. Probably the I would assume would be like the leader of or or those who are pressuring or maintaining the laws of the society mm-hmm. would be would be the you know the henchman if you will of the society <laughs> yeah. of the end there's a lot of political intrigue in right side i'm sure a lot of sabotage of careers and things well is that so so when i was reading about your you did the indexing for like but even books on like terrorism and stuff mm-hmm. i'm sure <laughs> reading stuff like on that probably helped you benefit for this book Maybe so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sabotage and all that cool stuff. Not cool stuff. You get my point. Mm. Interesting stuff. <laughs> Making it interesting. Oh, man. That's good. So when your characters uh, come up with the names, how did you how did you do that? Oh, well, I would take the first name of somebody I knew and the last name of somebody else I knew and put them together. That. Yeah, I love that. And then I, I have ethnic characters and I wanted them to, I wanted their names to reflect Earth, mm-hmm. where they came from. Yeah. So one of my main characters is is Hawaiian oh, by cool. ancestry. And I looked up a first name and a last name that yeah. were Hawaiian so I could give them to her. Nice, nice. Do you go through, like, you gather a bunch of lists of names you like and just, like, that one and that one. We'll see how that flows for now. Mm-hmm. And yeah, her name, is Kai, her name is Kai McKelly. Kai McKelly. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. The the name selection is always there. Are some people who are very, very personal with their names. There's other people who are like, that sounds right. We're just gonna go with that one. It's it's interesting. And like um, <laughs> I've I've heard of so many different methodologies. <laughs> you know what? I used to write true stories mm-hmm. um for true magazines. Okay. Uh true love, true romance, true story. I was one of their regular writers before yeah. they fo- right before they folded. Oh. And we always, the true writers would always laugh about the names. And one guy said, I want to give them the name of girl number one, boy number one, girl number two, boy number two, because they would always change the names. Oh, dear. Yeah. Oh, because, dear. you know, it's a, they're basically true stories in yeah. some form, and they don't want to be using real names. So I would always write a little note, say, I changed the names. If you're going to change them back, then please don't let it be this or this. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, to try to hide or not hide, but conceal their conceal Identity. identities as best as possible. Yeah. yeah. So when you were editing or not editing, when you were publishing your book, what, what did you find was one of the easiest aspects of doing so? You mean self-publishing or with Wild Rose? Well, you know, both, both. Oh. What did you find Self- was more, most enjoyable or easiest? Self-publishing was awful. Yeah. It was <laughs> because it's almost doomed to fail. I've seen those statistics that say the average self-publisher sells 12 books. Oh, Wow. Dang. Yeah. I wonder yeah. what, uh, how long ago was that? Uh, did you read up oh, on that? That was one? 2013, 14, around okay. there. Okay. And, you know, we had to format the book ourselves. Well, I had to format the book. Yeah. 
and that was awful. I couldn't figure out how to yeah. get the name of the book on one side of the top and the page number on the other side of the yeah. top. It took me weeks to figure that out. It was a mess. And I asked advice from people and nothing worked and it was a mess. Gross. I didn't like it. And then the marketing is almost impossible. Marketing is so bad. Marketing is terrible. I hate marketing. I, yeah, I, I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to learn, but it's just marketing is terrible. Even with, I've talked to so many people who traditional, uh, traditional hybrid and self, and regardless of what you're doing, you're almost always doing the marketing at one point in time, you're taking it over mm -hmm. and going. So I've, I've, yeah trying to i'm reading books on it just trying to dive in and do that it's so challenging it to, and to it takes a, time away from writing uh, yeah yeah you like it it's it got to the point with with marketing for me i was doing i was more worried about the attention the book was getting than actually doing anything with the story mm. and that is a tragedy <laughs> so because i mean at the end of the day you're a writer you want to get a story out there you want to, you want to finish a story. Yes. You want to get it out to the world, but if you don't have anything to get out to the world, what's the point of marketing? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's, it's a, yeah. it's a vicious cycle. It's a I, travesty. I do know a writer who solved her marketing problem. Yeah. She's a dedicated indie publisher, indie mm -hmm. writer, publishes her own books. And at one point she hired a public relations person. She paid something like $12,000 for a year of service, and she turned into a pretty well-known author in that year. That's awesome. Had a lot of success, mm. won a lot of awards, got a lot of attention. That's great. When you when you hire someone who navigates the the waters you're, you know, floating in trying to figure out how to do that, it's it's makes it a lot different, a lot better when you've got a plan. It's just so much easier to to uh, navigate that than hacking through the woods of let's try this way no that doesn't work let's try this <laughs> yeah, way no, you, that doesn't work you've got to have twelve thousand dollars <laughs> i mean eh, who knows it can happen it's just you do have to invest you do that's the thing though you do have to invest in yourself you do have to invest in the book or um and that's not, not necessarily money all the time it can just be sweat equity uh but i have found it's a kind of a kind of a mix of both between sweat equity and money because there's mm. it, you know, money talks is what they say. And so if you're using, if you're paying someone for their professional uh, either opinion or their services uh, to help you out, and then you bring the, whatever you bring and all that work you put in, it just sometimes I'm not saying all the time, but a lot of times it does, it, it works. It just works. Very challenging. How, how have you uh, handled the marketing waters for thus far um. recently, <laughs> recently? <laughs> yeah, I've had I've had issues to deal with this summer, so I haven't really started it yet. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've got a few weeks left, but I do have, what are they called? Blog posts, oh, okay. guest blog posts just lined up to come out next month. Nice. And I have um, festivals and events to go to. With my last couple of books, I started going to local festivals. There you go. And... And twice now I've gone to the local state parks, Bigfoot festival, selling awesome. a travel book and a history book and some novels it has nothing to do with Bigfoot. There's no Bigfoot in any novel. Yeah. And they are the nicest, friendliest people and they yeah. like books. Yeah. So I did really well. That's great. That's great. I, I find you just get out within the community and that helps out a lot yeah. going to like we there's art festivals out here or there's i went to my first my first like actual in-person book book sale because mm -hmm. uh we you know, with before was when covid was going on so we couldn't do it right and it was a car show and i'm like i mine is all you know uh high fantasy or or contemporary fantasy whatever you want to call it and i'm like car shows and fantasy it just doesn't really go together but I got to talk with a lot of cool people. I got to meet a lot of people in that work. Mm -hmm. You know, I might've sold yeah. maybe 10 books, whatever. I don't care. It was just getting out and enjoying myself and connecting with people. That's really what this is about. I mean, that's what we yeah. trying to do. Connect with the story. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're out there doing it, that's the part. Getting the leg work in is hard though, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially when yeah. you're busy, when you're busy working and everything like that. So besides doing this story, right side, wrong side, are you going to be doing anything else? Um, or is this kind of your primary focus for a while? 
It will be. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I started before I decided to, well, when I finished Right Side, Wrong Side, I decided I wanted an agent. Yeah. Because I thought it was the best writing I'd ever done and it deserved that. Yeah. A traditional publisher and an agent. And I found out that <laughs> I didn't know how to get an agent. I tried and I failed. And that was the end of that. Right. Um, but while I was abandoning the quest to get my book published, I started an, an historical novel about one of my ancestors. And I still want to do that. I just don't know when. I've got probably 30,000 words of it. And good. My ancestor, Anthony Evans, served on both sides of the Revolutionary War. Whoa. Yeah. Well, he joined um, the 8th Pennsylvania Regiment. Okay. He got captured over in New York somewhere. He was sent to a prison ship on Long Island. No, I don't know if it was a prison ship or a prison on Long Island. And he escaped from there. No. He joined the British Army. That's what it was. Joined the British Army in order to escape a prison ship. Now I've got it straight. And <laughs> they sent him to Long Island to a training camp, and he escaped from there and went back to the Americans. Oh, my gosh. What a story. It is a great story. A I want to story. write it. So it'll be, so is yet. it going to be just a, um, is this going to be, you know, uh, facts, 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 all purely nonfiction, <clears throat> or is it going to be no. historical fiction? Historical fiction. All right, yeah. cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love. Yeah, I made those. up a friend for him to join the army with, and no. she's a girl. Oh, oh okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, I I had a fun time finding out how many women actually served in the Revolutionary War, and okay. some of them didn't disguise themselves. They were married to soldiers, and they just kind of casually walked up to the artillery guns and learned to use them, and that was uh, that. And some of them got pensions. Wow. So not like yeah. Mulan where she's hiding herself and, you know, no. kind of hide her identity. Well, I'm, I'm... Some of the, most of them did yeah. disguise themselves as men. Oh my goodness. I had no idea. Yeah. That is so cool. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'll kind of, okay. Whenever you get that done, I want to, I want to check that <laughs> out. That's really neat. I love that. I'll I'm, get I'm, to I'm, it eventually. Oh yeah. 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 Get to, yeah, definitely get to it. Yeah. You got a lot of work on your, on your plate there to, uh, <laughs> to split off. It only, you could split yourself in two and have one person I know. Work, you work on one project, you work on the other project. I have like seven projects I want to get done. Mm. It's just, it's yeah, if we could, sometimes if we could just focus a little better, we could get it all done. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> if only I could focus a little more. I just get, I get, you know, there's a, there's glitter or shiny object and I just like, Ooh, new story <laughs> idea. Ooh, new story. Oh, idea. look, there's a deer in the front yeah. yard. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the sun's out. Let's go outside. Oh man, I'm hungry. <laughs> I, like I said, making any excuse not to write. It's so weird because like you want to be, when you're done, when you have this thing done, you're like, I did this. This is so cool. It's such a great yeah. feeling. But then when you're in the dirt and grime of writing it out and trying to piece it together, you're like, God, this sucks sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, you know, the brainstorm is really fun, but getting down to it, it's just, it's hard. It's really hard. Um, but I will say when you are in that, that, that flow that is, there's nothing like going on that flow when you can actually, re, you know, register to that when you can actually access mm -hmm. it. Because I'll go four, five, six hours, and I'll be like, "Oh, I need to, you know, sleep. <laughs> I got to <laughs> stop this and sleep." Mm -hmm. And it's it's so much fun. I love that. I haven't hit flow in a while just because of time and, oh, you know, energy. I had flow yesterday. Now, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> good for you. I'm envious. <laughs> I need to sit down and just re-access that flow again, get some more out there. I got a huge manuscript to edit at the moment. I got to just get on that and edit mm -hmm. some more. So I'm curious about Wild Rose Press. How did you get, how did you learn about them? How did you get in contact? Oh, start working with that them? was a complete and total fluke. Oh, I, I love belong, those. Yeah, I, I love, love belong stories. to Penn Writers. It's a statewide writers organization in Pennsylvania, and I can spit on Pennsylvania from where we live. So, so I decided to go to their annual conference and I did that. I joined the organization and they have a mini conference every year in Erie, PA. It's coming up fairly soon. And I just decided to go to that one okay. fall. <clears throat> I guess it was last fall. Okay. Yeah. About a year ago. Wow. I went there and 
when I, when I signed in at the registration desk, there was a sheet of paper to sign up for a pitch appointment with an editor from Wild Rose Press. And I hate pitches. I hate live pitches with a passion. I get really, really tied up and tangled up with what I want to say. And I do everything wrong. I say everything wrong. And it's a mess. Oh no! And I thought, no, I'm not going to sign up for that. And then I looked at it and I said, why not? You know, I'll just go ask questions sure. because I had heard of Wild Rose Press and I wanted to know more about the company. So I said, yeah. I'll just go ask questions, wrote my name down, came to the appointment and the editor and I clicked like we had known each other forever. Oh, that's awesome. Really cool. And I asked her every question I could think of about the company and we talked and talked and she said it, we had 15 minutes, I think. And she said, so what are you working on? Yeah. And I said, nothing. <laughs> and then I said, but you know what? I have this manuscript. And I told her about it. And she said, send it to me. She wanted the whole manuscript. And that's Whoa. never happened to me before. Yeah. And probably three months later, I had a contract. Wow. That's awesome. That's and crazy. It was, it was just a fluke. <laughs> I didn't even try. I just said, oh, I'll go ask questions. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I found with if when you just start kind of saying yes to things and you're willing to kind of go out of your comfort zone doing things, you're not really, oh, this is a long shot. Screw it. Why not? Things happen. They <laughs> like, do. Why? <laughs> or connections happen. And it's just, you, you know, try to be for those listening, try to be open to that kind of thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's an opportunity. Just jump on it and because see what can happen. Yeah. See what can happen. What What's the worst that can happen? They say no. Oh, darn. <laughs> okay, move on to the next one. Okay. And but it's an automatic no if you don't try. Right. You know, I mean that's that's the big one. But I'm I'm glad you did that. That's great. And they've been fun to work with, good to work with. Oh yeah, apps they are. They're good. good. Uh, the the editor that I got was the same editor I met. Oh, and that made it easier. Sweet. And did she did a any, great job. Did you have any say in that or you just it was by luck of the draw? No. Um I think she probably said I'll take this one oh, because okay. she well, had met cool. me. I was going to say, if that happened, like a, se and a second fluke happened, it was the same person. I'm like, uh, that's really cool. <laughs> we'll just say it was a fluke and, just, and then it's a really cool, a really, really <laughs> cool story. <laughs> mm. No, I like that a lot. That's that's insane. Um, so we'll start kind of wrapping up here real quick. But uh, I want to know if you had to, if someone come up to you at a conference, what is a tip you would give to a new aspiring budding writer, author who wants or writer who wants to become an author i would say read the talent of the room Ooh. do you know that read the talent of the room the talent of the room is an essay written oh. by some guy and if you just type in talent of the room you get it and it's it's just an essay but it talks about what it takes to be a writer I just wrote it down. Good. Look I that will up. check it's, it out. It's fascinating. Yeah. And that's the first thing that any aspiring writer should read. Interesting. Okay. I will check that out. Cool. Okay. The, right. second, the second thing I'd recommend is take some classes. Yeah. Um, meet other writers, you know, call the bookstore, call the library, join a writer's group. Mm -hmm. Just that, get those ideas and get that perspective down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that peer review is really important. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. So um, for those who want to get a hold of your book, Wrong Side, Right Side, or maybe even get a hold right of Right Side, other, Wrong Side. Wrong Side, Wrong Side. See, I'm doing it wrong. Right Side. Right Side, <laughs> wrong, wrong Side. side. Okay. Not the other way around. Right Side, Wrong Side. Um, where can they go get a copy of Right Side, <laughs> Wrong Side? Right Side, Wrong Side. Yes. Well, they will be. Um, Wild Rose is a small publisher. So the books are online. You can get them from Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Kobo or anywhere like that. There will be a paperback and an ebook. Nice. Fabulous. And then can they get your other books as well? Yeah, they're all there. Sweet. Mm -hmm. All right. Just look up Kathy Hester Seckman and boom, you've got all the books to read. All right. the books to read. Well, Kathy, this has been fabulous and super fun. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule. And thank you for dealing with the time snafu because we're three hours apart and <laughs> had a, wires crossing and that happens. So I appreciate your flexibility and, uh, and your time. So thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. This has yeah. been really fun. I'm really glad. I just try to make it fun for all of us just to have a nice conversation about getting your books out because 
we write for we write for fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, we're a little weird. We like to talk about that stuff. Just how it goes. So, <laughs> Obviously, you like to talk about it a lot. Oh because, yeah, I like to listen yes. to it a lot too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again. And if you, when when you get more books done, you want to do another interview? I'd love to catch up with you. Absolutely. Thank you. Sweet. My pleasure. Well, guys, I really hope you enjoyed this. Uh, go check out her books. Uh, comes out October thirtieth, twenty twenty three, and be on the lookout for more Kathy Hester Seckman novels. All right, guys. I hope you have a great rest of your day and weekend. And as always, stay mighty and keep reading. Are you an author? Do you know someone who is? If so, then message me, Ryan Oliver, at ryanmoliver.com to set up a free appointment to discuss being showcased on the Mighty Books Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to the Mighty Books YouTube channel and share the link to this and more episodes with your friends and family. Thanks for listening. So long for now. Stay mighty and keep reading.